Good morning, church family. And uh, I just want to thank Kyle and Macy for leading us uh, in worship this morning again. What a blessing it is uh, that they are here uh, leading us, and what a, what a glorious time it is to worship the Lord together. Um, I wore a purple shirt today. I'm just giving a shout out to uh, UMHB, starting back classes, go crew. Um, and uh, I know that uh, it'll be a challenging semester, but I'm, I'm praying for each of our students, and uh, we welcome them back, uh, not only online, but also uh, in person uh, at our church. So uh, God bless you all, and uh, we're praying for all of our teachers and students as uh, schools start back up and, and get going. Um, you know, our scripture passage today uh, deals with an issue that we're all pretty well familiar with, and uh, one in which uh, each of us has probably been engaged with at some point in our life. I entitled this message, uh, Equality with a Spiritual Dimension. And um, the, the issue that we're talking about is uh, partiality, um, favoritism, and dealing with that. You know, not being raised here and now living in Texas, <laughs> I'm very well aware of the partiality created by this culture. Uh, Texans are famous for their pride in their culture. And, uh, you know, our family may not have been born here, but we got here as soon as we could. <laughs> and, uh, you know, most people who have lived here all of their lives uh, have somewhat similar values. Uh, not, not exactly the same, but they're similar in nature. And sometimes y'all are skeptical of those who aren't from around here, especially from those up north. And, um, but listen, this attitude is not limited to the South. I mean, all people have a tendency to be partial and even prejudiced. And those, you know, of the middle class, they, they may tend to criticize the wealthy. Uh, the wealthy tend to look down upon the poor. Uh, the educated are sometimes demeaning to those who are uneducated. You know, we could list many examples, but the fact remains that Humanity, all of humanity, is prone to partiality and prejudice. Now, I will admit that not all partiality is a bad thing. Um, I am partial to certain styles of cooking. Uh-huh. Uh, Central Texas barbecue is delicious. There's, there's no doubt about that. I'm also partial to our way of life. I, I enjoy spending time with my sweet wife and, and our children, our kids, and, and our yummy grandchildren, as my wife says. They're just yummy. She loves that word lately. But I, I relish the time uh, with our church family and the many relationships that we've been able to uh, build and, and realize over the last decade. Um, I certainly am partial to Memorial Baptist Church. I love our people. So not all partiality is, is bad. However, we must ensure that partiality does not stand in our way of fulfilling the work that the Lord has for us and His expect, expectation for us as we uh, live our lives. See, we cannot deny the effects of partiality within the church. I mean, fellowship can be this warm and welcoming church for all people, but I can assure you that not all churches are that way. Some congregations have unwritten rules regarding who's acceptable and who's not. We don't like to think of it that way, and we like to think that we're not partial, but there is many times an underlying unwritten code, if you will. This is exactly the danger, though, that James warns us about in our text. We must all see people that, that see all people as, as loved by God, as, as, as his creation and in desperate need of a relationship with him, regardless of their color, regardless of social status, re, regardless of education or, or any other cultural preference. See, God loves people. He loves humanity. We are made in his image. So if you have your scripture with you, and I'd invite you to turn with me to James uh, chapter 2, and uh, as we continue to work our, work, our, work our way excuse me, through this great 
uh, letter and great book in the Bible, James chapter 2. So let me ask you a question here. If, if you wanted to, not that you would ever want to, but let's just say that you did. If you wanted to deny the faith, how would you do it? You know, you wake up one morning and you decide you want to deny the faith. How would you go about doing that? I mean, do you renounce your, your, your membership? Do you write a book or a pamphlet uh, criticizing uh, the central principles of, of the Christian faith? Uh, do you go down and join a, a local um, atheist club? I mean, how, how would you deny the faith? Well, James tells us that one way that you can deny the faith Try showing favoritism towards some and bias towards others. See, James counts that as a fundamental denial of the faith. I mean, think about it. To show favoritism is a denial of the faith and the gospel. See, if that's true, we better find out what he means by favoritism. Because in this passage, James teaches us that the Christian faith is completely incompatible with favoritism. Folks, we need to understand this, especially in this day and this time. See, favoritism in the church was a problem in James's day, and it can still be a problem in many churches and among, among many people groups. And it's a deadly evil that violates Christian fellowship. Now, as we read, I'm going to read, start reading in verse 2 down through verse 4, and we'll talk about that a little bit, and then verses 5 through 9, and then I'm going to come back and hit verse 1. But um, stick with me, just have your scripture open, and, and we'll, we'll go through this passage. See, we have the problem of favoritism in the church exposed in verses 2, 3, and 4 of chapter 2 of James. This is what James writes, and he says, For if a man comes into your assembly, the word there is synagogue, into your uh, assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and you say, sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? <laughs> wow. Showing preference, showing partiality, showing favoritism. <laughs> you know, Bishop Potter he was sailing for Europe on one of those great transatlantic ocean liners. And when he came on board, he found that another passenger was to share the cabin with him. And after going to see the accommodations, he came up to the check-in desk and he inquired if he could leave his gold watch and a few of his other personal items uh, in the, the ship's safe. And he explained that ordinarily he would never do this, but... He had been to his cabin and he met the man who was to occupy the other cubicle. And judging from his appearance, he was afraid that he might not be a, a trustworthy person. Well, the concierge, he uh, accepted the responsibility for the valuables, but he also said this. He said, it's all right, Bishop. He said, I'll be very glad to take care of these for you. You know, the other man has been up here already and he left his stuff for the same reason. See, it goes both ways. Partiality, favoritism. We might call it discrimination. We might call it prejudice. We might call it racism. Whatever we want to label it. But it goes both ways. And that's exactly what James is addressing here. The practice of favoritism in the church is also condemned in James. And let's read on in, in, in verse 5 and following. It. James says this. He says, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? 
If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Pretty stiff words. He's condemning this practice of showing favoritism, showing partiality. You know, the sin of partiality has persisted in often subtle but sometimes blatant ways even in evangelical churches. I mean, for example, you know, one principle of the church growth movement is called the homogenous unit principle. And it's based on the observation that people like to worship with their own kind. So we need to target our outreach programs and build our churches with the aim of reaching similar segments of society. So these folks try to market the church, if you will, to, let's say, baby boomers or, or the Generation Xers, uh, each with their own demographic preferences. I've even heard of churches aiming at the up and outers, <laughs> the rich who seem to be, uh, have everything but God. Now, probably such specialized churches would not deliberately exclude anyone who didn't fit into their target audience, but neither would they go out of their way to make such people feel comfortable. I mean, they define their niche and they do everything to shape their product, their church, to appeal to that niche. See, all such approaches violate what James is saying here, and they ignore the glory of the New Testament church. Colossians 3 verse 11 says, in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, between circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Powerful words about the New Testament church. See, the makeup of the local church should puzzle the world. It should baffle them. I mean, the world should not be able to explain how people of different ethnicities, people of economic and, and social levels that differ, people of different age groups, how they could come together in love and harmony. See, to divide up the church along such lines, it obliterates the glory of God and the salvation of Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm not sure about you, but I personally am sick of hearing other people's opinions. Whether that's online, whether that's um, news snippets that we hear, news bites, uh, you know, uh, sound bites. Um, seems like everyone has an opinion about everything and not the least about everyone else and their motives these days. I mean, we in the church, we're no exception. We do it Many of us, just like the rest of the world. I mean, show me, give me a humble, gentle lover of God who also loves others, a person full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's what our world needs to see. Not all the junk that is going on bigotry, prejudice, racism. That is too strong an attachment to our own creed of opinion. In a culture of cancel, where they just want to cancel people if they don't agree with everything that they stand for or everything, every little part of their opinion. Well, I'm just going to cancel you. You don't count for anything. See, that's the culture that is out in the world. That is not to be the culture of the church, of believers. 
We're to be inclusive, not exclusive. We're to be fencing in, not fencing out. And I think this is huge because James hits the nail on the head where we are in our culture today. I mean, how unwilling people are. How unwilling we are to allow anything good to be seen in or said about those who do not agree with us on every single little thing. It's like if, if you disagree with me on one point, then you're no good and, and, and I don't, I don't want to hear anything that you have to say. Folks, it should not be that way. I'm tired of hearing people's opinions. We must not narrow the cause of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to our own views and our own opinions, but rejoice in His goodness whenever and wherever it appears. Oh, we need that. We need to be encouraging and loving, helping one another, lifting each other up, even if there are minor disagreements on opinions about things. God's Word never changes. We need to be lifting up His Word. And this is exactly what James is talking about. The overall theme here is if you have true saving faith, then you will practice impartiality. That you will be for all people. See, Christian love means treating others the way the Lord treats us and doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he, he condemns this favoritism. He, he, he gives us a picture of the scenario and, and this is what's going on and then he condemns it. But notice, notice the practice of favoritism in the church is remedy. He gives us the remedy in verse 1. In verse 1 it says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. <laughs> See, it's faith in Christ <laughs> that brings us all, whatever our backgrounds, into God's family as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. See, James opens with a command. <laughs> he says, do not hold our faith in glory in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. When he says do not, the Greek construction there has the nuance, stop doing it. Stop doing it. Stop showing personal favoritism. Stop holding your faith up in that in our Lord Jesus Christ with your personal favoritism, with your personal biases, with your personal prejudices involved in that. He says, stop doing it. James had already observed this sinful practice taking place and he's writing to correct a problem before it gets worse. See, James is familiar with with Isaiah 42, verse 8. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. <laughs> See, it would be idolatry to ascribe glory to a creature. So when James refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, as glorious, he's ascribing deity to Jesus. He's giving glory to Jesus Christ, God's Son. See, this is one of only two references to Jesus Christ by name in this entire letter. The first one is in chapter 1, verse 1, where he calls himself a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then here, where he says, 
in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. By focusing on Jesus in his glory. Brothers and sisters, that should capture, that should arrest our attention. What James says here. He addresses the problem of favoritism in, in a couple of ways. First, he says, he gets us to see how petty our differences, our distinctions between the rich and poor, or whatever those distinctions we want to make, whatever they are, how petty they are. See, even the most powerfully rich people on earth are nothing compared to the glory of Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Do you remember in the Old Testament, King Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, he thought he was something. He thought he was great. But God humbled him. Humbled him to the point where he ate grass like a beast out in the field. God humbled him. And when he came to his senses, he acknowledged that God alone, God alone is great. See, when we exalt people on account of their wealth or their power or their status or their influence, we rob glory from Jesus Christ who sovereignly gives us everything that we are and have comes from him. When we exalt others rather than him, we are robbing glory from him and we're giving glory to them. See, rather than exalting the rich, we should exalt the supreme glory of Christ alone. We are all his unworthy servants. Focusing on the glory of Christ puts us in our proper place before him. Of course, as it says in Romans 13, we should grant honor to those whom honor is due. But honor towards Christ and honor towards men are on two different planes. That's two different things that we're talking about. Secondly, when James ascribes glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, he points to his coming in power and glory to judge the earth. I mean, James will mention judgment at the end of his argument in, in, in verses 12 and 13 here. But in verse 4, he says that when we make distinctions among people based on outward factors, we set ourselves up as judges with evil motives or thoughts. Maybe we're showing them favoritism because of what we can get from them. Maybe we're showing them partiality because of what they could do for us. Maybe somehow we're doing that. But understand, we don't see the hearts of people like God does. To judge a person based on their Outward appearances is to usurp the place of Jesus Christ in his glory as judge of all the earth. We make ourselves the judge. And that's really what James is talking about. See, there are many ways that we can fall into sin that James is warning us against here. Do we understand? Do you understand that showing favoritism will be a temptation all throughout our life, but we must always war against it. We can't just give in to it and, and go with it. See, we can fight this temptation with assistance from these following perceptions that I'm going to give you when we perceive some things here. First, I would say by recognizing that we are all sinners saved by grace. When James says that God promised the kingdom in verse 5 of chapter 1 to those who love him, he's describing the result of salvation, not the means of it. Salvation is completed by God's grace. 
and it's received through faith alone. We read about that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith. But God, when God lavishes His love on us, His grace on us, we respond by loving Him because He first loved us. We're all sinners saved by grace. When we recognize that, it helps us not elevating others, not exalting others and showing favoritism toward others. Secondly, when we, by recognizing that we are a priesthood of believers. In Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6, it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, and released us from our sins by his blood. He has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He's made us a, a priesthood, if you will, of all believers. We need to recognize that. We need to, that, we need to be cognizant of that. That we're all saved by grace, we're all sinners saved by grace, but we're all priests of believers, a priesthood of believers. And and thirdly, I would say by recognizing that we are members of God's family. You know, when James says that God chooses the poor to be rich in faith, he means rich in the sphere of faith. We have spiritual riches in Christ through God's sovereign gracious choice which brought us to faith in him paul argues about that and he talks about that in ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14 god's choice makes us heirs in the kingdom according to chapter 1 verse 5 in james joint heirs with jesus see at the moment of salvation we come under the reign of christ in our hearts But there also remains in the future the fullness of his kingdom and its blessings when Jesus returns in power and in glory. We read about that in Matthew 25. So by recognizing that we are part of God's family, we are members of God's family. Also by recognizing that we are to share and share alike in the privileges of but also the responsibilities of the church. See, we all have a role to play. We all have something to do in the body of Christ. And we're to share in that, and we're to share alike in that, so that we're all part of the same same body. We might have different functions. We might have different roles. But we're all part of the same body. And the, 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 the ground at the foot of the cross is level. All of us come to Jesus. We come into to his family, his kingdom, in the same way, by accepting his sacrifice on the cross for our sin. We're all in that together. I would say also, lastly, by recognizing that we are all personally accountable to God for our words and our actions. For the things that we do in this body. You know, Romans 14, verse 10 says, But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. I'm not the judge. Who am I to judge a brother that is different than I am in some way? Who am I to judge? I'm not the judge. He has not given me that. Jesus and Jesus alone is the judge. You know, you you understand this also in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, "In And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. So brothers and sisters, recognize in this 
culture that we live in today. We need to exercise equality with a spiritual dimension. We need to show others the grace that we've been given. We need to include others in what we are doing. We need to to love our brothers and sisters and love our neighbor as ourself. Regardless of of, of their ethnicity, regardless of where they are economically or on the social ladder, if you will. But however they come to us, we need to regard them as loved by God, welcoming them into his kingdom, in the church. Oh, we need, we need all that we can possibly get in the church today, giving glory and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, the footings of church equality lie deep in our common condition as sinners. In our common deliverance by grace that we don't deserve. In our common relationship to God through Jesus Christ. In our common priesthood that we have to one another. That we are priests to one another and to God, ministering and serving each other, but also serving the Lord. And also in our common accountability to Him. Because someday we will give an account before Almighty God for the things that we have said and thought and done in this fleshly body. Let's pray together. Loving Father, I thank you for your word. And I pray that you would challenge us, Holy Spirit, to become and to be more than we are. Father, to rise above the sectarianism, the tribalism, the racism, the the junk that is going on in our culture today that we would be about your kingdom and that we would see your kingdom in unity, in oneness, even as you see us in oneness. Father, I pray that we would be done with this lower level junk, that we would no longer be bottom feeders, buying into the lies of our culture, but that we would rise again and rise above and set our eyes upon the author and finisher of our faith, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died for us, who died and bled out for more than we are in our society and in our culture today. Lift us. Father, lift our heads so that we can see what you desire us to be and to become. Father, I pray that you would do that through your Holy Spirit, for your glory and for your honor. Father, may we be powerful, dangerous, influential people in our society. May we be what you've called us to be, salt and light in a dark world. Father, may that be so by your power and by your might. In Jesus' name we pray.